the topic of my talk is uh, bias preservation in machine learning, um, the legality of fairness metrics in the non-discrimination law. Um, yes, this is my latest work that I have published with two of my co-authors, um, Brent Middlestead and Chris Russell. And I'm actually quite glad that the idea and the importance of interdisciplinary work was just mentioned because that's exactly where my heart lies as well. I'm a lawyer by background. Brent Middlestead is an ethicist and Chris Russell um, is a machine learning expert and we have worked together in the past when it came to explainability issues and now we try to tackle uh, fairness together. So this is our latest work that I'm very excited to present to you today. Um, roughly, this is the overview um, and the plan that I will follow during my presentation. I will have a section that talks a little bit about uh, what fairness actually means in legal terms. Then I will move over and talk about what fairness actually means in computer science. And the third section will show how those two notions actually collapse and clash. Um, but to start off, um, I think it might be actually nice to, if I tell you the findings of the paper first and then show you how I actually arrived at my conclusion. So what I believe um, is that we're currently standing at a very important crossroad when it comes to AI fairness and bias issues. I think we have three options available in front of us and we have to be very careful which path we actually choose, we're choosing. The first option is we can just don't just don't do anything and just um, deploy algorithms in the world and look how they exacerbate um, current inequalities further. Um, the second option is that we actually acknowledge that there is problems when it comes to AI bias and then try to um, fix the technology around that, trying to uh, make sure that things are not getting worse, keeping the status quo. And the third option is we could actually see technology as a tool that enables us to detect where inequalities lie and try to use that as a starting point to bring about social um, change and actually start to fix society. So those are the three options that we have ahead of us, making things worse, um, keeping things as they are and trying to make things better. So when I talk about bias in AI, I think it might actually be helpful to first um, explain what I mean by that. When I talk about bias, I roughly can see two types of biases. This distinction is very much inspired by, by Nissenbaum, um, where you can roughly distinguish between technical bias and societal bias. So technical bias means that the problem that you're facing stems from the technology itself. Facial recognition software, for example, is one of the um, well-known examples of that. Facial recognition software works less accurate on uh, female faces and faces of, from people of color. Um, this is mainly the reason because the technology was trained on predominantly white male um, pictures and therefore the algorithm is more familiar with that type and therefore is less accurate for anybody who doesn't fall into this realm. So you see the technology has some sort of problem that then translates into the real world and there has an impact. On the other hand, you can have societal bias. Societal bias is when the trouble that you're facing actually stems from the human that is making the decision. And the decision that they're making and the data that they're generating have their own biases in it and is then being fed into the algorithm and then applied to human decision-making and then um, finds its way in our, in our world and therefore causes problems there. Of course, this distinction is not very clean um, because one obviously informs the other. There's a reason uh, why the design choice was chosen to only use or predominantly use a white male faces to train facial recognition software. So it's not a clear cut distinction, but I think it's still very helpful because it shows you um, what kind of goals people have taken upon themselves to fix. Are they trying to fix technology? Or are they trying to find ways to fix society? So with that, um, the question is, what is it that the law actually wants to do? What does fairness actually mean in legal terms? So it will come as no surprise that law is actually about fixing society. But what does fairness actually mean in legal terms? What does it mean? And um, yes, everybody will probably be familiar with the idea that everybody is equal 
um, the law, <clears throat> sorry, um, which just goes back to Aristotle, who said we ought to treat uh, like cases alike and unlike cases differently. Nobody will disagree with that. But the question is, what do we actually mean by equal treatment? Um, and to show this typical conundrum, I actually want to talk about a very personal story um, that helped me to, to visualize that as uh, myself. Um, I must have been around six or seven years old when we read uh, a short story in, in, in school, which was called the, the Wise Judge. So the Wise Judge, the story centers around two siblings, a brother and a sister, who are fighting over um, a cake. Um, and they cannot decide how to cut the cake up evenly. And because they couldn't find a solution, they actually seek the wisdom of a judge. And the judge in its infinite wisdom comes up and says, well, we're gonna make um, the brother cut the cake first and the sister gets to choose the first piece. And I remember reading that story when I was a child and I thought that's very elegant, that's perfect, that is flawless. How amazing uh, of a bulletproof idea to make sure that everybody gets an equal share of a cake. And I think back then I realized if a discipline is able to create something so beautiful and so bulletproof and so elegant and fair, I wanna be part of it. And I think most people will agree that it is a very elegant way of figuring out um, or making sure that everybody gets an equal share. But what if I told you that the sister hasn't eaten in three weeks? Would you still think that this method of dividing up the cake is fair and actually um, serves justice? You might not. And that's exactly where the conundrum comes from. And that's the conundrum that non-discrimination law deals with. We have roughly two types of concepts in non-discrimination law. One is called formal equality. The other one is called substantive or de facto equality. So formal equality means I'm trying to treat everybody equal. I'm trying to close my eyes, not look at the individual and try to make sure that everybody gets an equal sized piece of cake. Substantive equality, on the other hand, tries not to close the eyes um, to the differences between groups. It actually wants to take into consideration that some people are more hungry than others and try to take them into consideration when they actually making a decision of dividing up resources. And this can be seen in either equal opportunity or for example, inequality of results. So this is actually um, how the law tries to deal with that, acknowledging that there are two different ways of thinking about fairness. And those two concepts actually found their way into the law itself. Um, we have, for example, pro prohibitions against direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Um, you have direct discrimination, which means um, you're treating somebody less favorably because of protected attribute that they possess. So you're treating somebody less favorable because of their ethnicity, their gender, um, their sexual orientation, their ability. In most cases, this will be illegal. This goes back to Aristotle on the idea of formal equality. Everybody um, ought to receive the same treatment. On the other hand, you have indirect discrimination. So indirect discrimination, which is more akin to substantive equality means that if a seemingly neutral provision criterion or practice is applied to everybody equally, and it just so happens that it poses a particular disadvantage on a particular protected group when compared with others in a similar situation, then this gives rise to um, the idea of indirect discrimination that needs to be justified. So what does that mean roughly? So for example, if I had, if I'm an employer and I decide to only hire people that are taller than two meters, then height is obviously not a protected attribute. It's a neutral provision that is applied to everybody equally. But you will immediately understand that a height requirement could be disadvantaging at least women when making those decisions. And that is exactly what the what indirect discrimination um, prohibitions are supposed to be doing. They're actually created as a detecting mechanism, as a, as a tool that diagnoses um, discrimination. It is something that is supposed to draw your attention to the social hurdles and <laughs> struggles and factual differences between the groups. So you can use it as a starting point to dismantle the underlying power structures and unfairness in society. Um, 
So it's actually designed to show you where more social engineering needs to be done. The underlying assumption is that everybody is equal. And if the outcome isn't equal across groups, then there is something wrong with your system, not the people. And therefore, you need to figure out why inequality has occurred and you have to try to contravene it. If it actually happens that there is unfair outcome between certain groups, then it gives rise to prima facie discrimination, which means that you then need to justify it, um, give an account for why this is actually happening. So those are the two, um, two ideas. It's very clear from what we've seen in the literature, from the case law and the legal statutes, that the declared aim of non-discrimination law is substantive equality. It is not just formal equality. It is really about actively dismantling inequality. It's about redistributing resources. It's making sure that everybody gets an equal share to social goods. It's not just about economic disadvantage, it's also about cultural and political and social rights. It's about promoting uh, diversity, social inclusion, making sure that people are part of the community. It's about solidarity. So it's actually an active duty to um, establish equality across groups in a society. So roughly to think about it, you can um, see it as a, as a race, if you will. Formal equality would, for example, assume that men and women just race against each other and whoever wins um, is the winner, gets the job, whatever it might be. Formal equality assumes there are no differences between men and women and they don't take into consideration that physical uh, strength might be different between the sexes. Substantive equality acknowledges that and says that on average, there might be a physical strength difference between those sexes. And therefore we try to countervene that. We can do that in a more extreme way uh, by equality of results, where, for example, affirmative action by saying, I want a certain percentage of women to win that race. A more subtle way is equal opportunity where you don't care about the outcome so much, but you're trying to change the process. So you would, for example, move women a little bit ahead um, in the race to account for physical differences here. Um, but that is a more formal approach. The actual underlying idea of, of, of substantive equality is that you start to question whether the criteria that you're using to measure merit are actually um, good proxies for competence, because you could say that physical strength will always favor men and actually has a very biased history. And actually physical strength is not necessarily the best way to measure competence. And therefore you look out for different ways of measuring merit and you come to the conclusion, maybe it would be better if they were playing chess against each other. So that is the idea of substantive equality. It's not about equal, it's not about affirmative action, giving a leg up. It's trying to question whether the criteria that we're using are actually measuring merits and trying to figure out whether those criteria inherit past biases of, of certain groups and trying to make sure that we actually level the playing field and get the best people. It's about uncovering hidden talent. That is exactly what substantive equality wants to do. Again, um, law in a short wants to fix society. So let's look at what fairness in computer science looks like. Um, I would assume it comes as no surprise that people in tech try mainly to fix tech. And therefore, most of what comes up there is a tech solution, obviously. Um, what we have done is trying to figure out how they actually approach this. So roughly, um, what happens in computer science is that they rely on a concept which is called conditional independence. That means you're trying to make sure when you employ a decision-making system that the target variable um, that you want to predict is independent from um, protected attributes and some other um, conditioning attribute. So what does that mean? I want to, if I want to make sure, if I want to give somebody a loan, which is my target variable, I want to make sure that this prediction is independent from race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and an additional conditioning attribute, for example, salary. 
Um, so this is how it's being done. Um, usually it runs in a very similar way for all types of decision-making processes. What you do in order to figure out if somebody should get a loan is you're asking yourself, have prior candidates repaired loans that look similar to the applicant that is now applying for a loan? And based on this distinction, based on conditional independence, uh, we have come up with a classification system, classification system of bias metrics that currently exist. There are bias metrics that we have coined are bias preserving, and there are bias metrics that are bias transforming metrics. Our distinction focuses on the fact that bias preserving fairness metrics try to evaluate if a decision is fair by matching error rates across groups. What does that mean? You are tasked to figure out whether the false positives and the false negatives are being made at the same rate in the past and now. So in other words, you're trying to preserve error rates. You're trying to make sure that you're not making things worse than they have been in the past, therefore bias preserving. The other category that we came up with is bias transforming. Those are all other tests that are, be, uh, that are out there. The key difference be between bias transforming metrics is that this test is satisfied when the decision rates, so the outcomes, are matched uh, are equal across groups. Whereas the other one, bias uh, preserving, is only satisfied if the uh, error rates are matched, so decision rates um, versus error rates. So let's go back to bias preserving fairness metrics. At first glance, it actually looks quite fair, doesn't it? Because you look at past loan decisions and you ask yourself the question, has a person that looks similar to the current applicant repaired a loan, right? You um, do this for all kinds of decision. Um, you, for example, when you're admitting for university, you look at the current student that's applying, looking at a past similar student asked, did they do well in law school, for example? Um, you do the same with job applicants. If past uh, applicants look like current applicants and they did well in their career, um, then you're gonna give them a shot. If people who look similar, um, like past applicants of health insurance, in fact, did not get sick, then you give health insurance to them. So you look at the past um, because you assume that there's some ground truth about it. You're trying to look at the past, trying to make assumptions about the future. You're justifying the future by using the past. You're trying to use the status quo as a neutral starting point to make decisions. The problem is the status quo is not at all neutral. And I think I cannot stress this enough. I want to just give two examples here um, because of time constraints. In the paper, we make much more um, examples, so I invite you to have a look at that. Um, let's talk about grades. Um, let's talk about um, what what role grades play in our society. I think everybody will agree that you know that when you're marking somebody, that there is an element of subjectivity to it. That's obviously bias can creep into that. But what about math? grades, for example. Um, you could say there's some ground truth. Two and two is four. There's not much room for interpretation. So you could say, if I'm using math grades to so decide if somebody should get a job or a fellowship, be admitted to grad school, whatever it might be, I have some ground truth. I have a good metric to measure merit, and therefore it's fine to use that. Yeah, well, you might be interested to, to hear that in 2015, interesting studies showed that teachers in middle and high school um, assess the mathematical abilities of boys more favorably than girls, even though they're just as good or even more capable than the, than the boys in the class. That leads that their grades are actually worse than those of boys. They get less mentorship and they're less encouraged to take up STEM in the future. But it's not just the teachers that have that bias inherent in themselves, it's also the male peers at university that drink, rank female performance less than male performance, even though their competences are equal, if not better. The same bias then continues in the job market, where interesting um, research shows that if you send two batches of identical CVs to job advertisements, one batch with male sounding names and one with female sounding names, you will see that both male and female assessors will um, 
rank the qualities and the competences of women less than men. And if they're actually offered a job, they get less salary and more often overseen for promotions. The problem is that this type of stereotypical thinking starts very early on in our minds. Research shows that by the age of six, children already have those stereotypes baked into them. If you show children pictures of boys doing cooking and sewing, they will misremember seeing a girl. So this is a problem because AI does not know about this. And I would imagine that most of us don't actually know about this. We don't know about the social story between the data points. And now think about how often we use grades and salaries and how often somebody has been promoted as ideas of how meritable somebody is, how often grades influence whether you get a job or a fellowship or grad school, how often promotions or salaries are being used to assess whether somebody is a good worker. Those data points, even though they look neutral, are not. They are not biased because the status quo is not neutral. Similar tendencies obviously can be found um, when it comes to, to, to race and ethnicity. A similar example was conducted where identical CVs were sent out um, to job advertisements. One had white sounding names, the other batch black sounding names, 50%, 50% higher callback rates for white sounding names. On average, people of color receive less salaries. They are less associated with prestigious jobs. The reference letters that they receive often describe them as team workers and hardworking, whereas white male counterparts are often described as geniuses and trailblazers. During the interviews, white people send, tend to sit further away from people of color. They give them less time to answer um, interview questions and the end the interview much quicker, leading to them being less employed um, than white people. And again, people and AI very often don't know about this. The social story between the data points is not apparent to everybody. And again, just think about how often you use your CV to get a job, to get into education, to get a grant, salaries that are being used to decide if somebody should get a loan or a mortgage or insurance, what kind of advertisements are being shown to you, all dependent on salaries, reference letters that are being used for jobs or housing or loans, we see those criteria as objective, but they are not. Um, it is really, really important to keep that in mind that if you're using a bias preserving fairness metrics that assumes that the status quo is neutral, you're freezing the status quo and you're maintaining things as they are, but the status quo is not neutral. And this is exactly where law and computer science start to clash. Um, because if we just go back to the underlying assumptions in, in computer science, uh, you will see that one type of fairness metrics, bias preserving, the ones that try to match the error rates, says basically, I'm happy as long as things keep on as they are, as long as they don't get worse. The other one, in contrast, the one that is trying to match decision rates is saying, I'm only ha happy if the outcome is equal across groups. So I have one bias metric, type of bias metric says, I'm happy as long as we're keeping the status quo. And the other one says, I'm only happy if equal access has actually occurred. With those assumptions in mind, let's go back to what non-discrimination law actually wants to achieve. So again, what we can say is that bias preserving fairness metrics, the ones that try to match the error rates, is more akin to formal equality, trying to treat everybody equal, and that's the only thing that you're doing, without trying to change the underlying things. Bias transforming metrics, on the other hand, the ones that try to match decision rates, are more akin to substantive equality, which is the idea of changing the things. So if the idea of the law, as I mentioned, is actually to erode inequality, to dismantle disparity, and to achieve parity and inclusion, keeping things as they are is just not good enough from a legal perspective. And since bias-preserving metrics condition on an unneutral status quo and freezing them, this is a legal problem. 
And therefore, we have argued that if you know that you're deploying a decision-making system that is making decisions about people in an area that is known to have bias problems, for example, hiring, and you're using a bare, uh, fairness preserving metrics, this gives rise to prima facie discrimination. And therefore, this choice needs to be justified. Um, yes. It's important to keep that in mind because the idea um, that bias preserving metrics bring with it is really much in conflict with the idea of establishing parity here. For example, bias preserving metrics also don't care about the reasons why people haven't been given jobs or loans. So a reason like somebody didn't have a PhD, therefore we didn't hire them, is just as good as I had a racial tendency and a uh, racist tendency, and therefore this person wasn't admitted. The reasons don't matter. It only matters if somebody was hired. That's a big problem. You're also trying to assume that you know something about accuracy. Trying to match error rate has the assumption of ground truth and that you actually know something about the truth of the world. But you actually don't because you don't have access to a counterfactual world. You only have data on the people that you gave the loan or the ones that you hired. You didn't have, you don't have any data on the people you didn't give a loan or that you um, yeah, that you didn't give the job, right? So actually talking about accuracy is a problem. Of course, you can use certain types of proxies. People do that. Um, for example, trying to assess if somebody has a good uh, probability of reappearing a loan, you use their credit score. Um, if you want to figure out if somebody is going to break the law, you predict if they will be arrested. But there's a mismatch between between the thing you want to predict and the variable that you're actually using. And using those type of biases just inherits new types of biases and actually does exactly the same thing, freezing the status quo and making things worse. And the last thing is by conditioning on the status quo and by taking the ground truth as neutral, you're completely overestimating the role of meritocracy in our world. The status quo is not uh, neutral. We have to acknowledge that inheritance and luck and unequal opportunities and discrimination accounts for a lot of the opportunities that we get in our lives. Um, there is interesting um, data on social mobility, for example, in the US, where it shows that 40% of children that were born into the poorest income group um, will remain there for the rest of their lives. The same counts true for 20% um, in Nordic countries, 30% in the UK. Actually, an OECD study from 2020 on social mobility shows that it takes six, six generations in Germany to move from the lowest income bracket to an average income bracket, six generations, uh, three in Finland um, and five in Switzerland and Austria. So, um, this is very important, and um, this assumption that underlines those type of fairness, fairness metrics. So the question obviously arises, how many of the fairness metrics that are out there are actually bias preserving and how many are bias transforming? So what we did is we um, looked at 20 uh, fairness metrics that are currently out there um, and tried to assess this. Um, 13 out of 20 are bias preserving, therefore assuming the status quo is neutral and freezing it. Um, the other ones are bias transforming. This is not to say that bias transforming, uh, that bias preserving metrics have no points um, at all or cannot be used for certain purposes. They can. They can be used in instances where you don't make decisions about people, so for diagnostics or for testing or for research purposes. Um, or in situations where you don't know what the right decision actually is and your only worry is um, to not make things worse than they used to be, or where you do actually have information to ground truth labels, or where there is no bias, um, or in a situation where you're in a jurisdiction where only formal equality is pursued. In those instances, you can definitely use bias preserving fairness metrics. But what we're saying that in Europe, if you're making decisions that have consequences for people in a protected sector, and this sector is known to have inequalities by choosing this fairness metrics, 
you are giving rise to prima facie discrimination and you need to legally justify it. Otherwise you're gonna be liable for discrimination. What's important here is that when you're choosing a fairness metrics, you're making an explicit decision on whether or not the status quo is acceptable or not. And you have to be very aware that that's the choice that you're making. Choosing a fairness metrics is not a neutral act. So after all of this question arises, well, who should be doing all of this? It sounds great, everybody's on board with equality, but who is the duty to actually do all of this? Um, and of course, this is, you know, the, the hot potato that nobody really wants to touch. Um, if you look at the literature, if you look at the case law, um, it's very scattered. Everybody agrees that you have an active duty to dismantle inequality. It's not quite clear who and to what extent people are actually supposed to do that. It is very clear, and I'll make that very clear, that both the public and the private sector have that duty but it's not very clear at what point it actually uh, kicks in. Some say there's a preemptive duty for public and private entities to dismantle inequality. So even if there are no complaints, others say, well, you only have to do that if a complaint actually arises. Um, others say that complaint-based systems are actually not good at all because then you have to rely on people um, to actually bring justice forward. And then it's just an individual type of justice actually it should be much more holistic. Again, a lot of discrepancy about discussion around that. It's not quite clear who is supposed to do what and to what extent. The only thing that is clear that both the private and the public sector have an active duty to dismantle inequality in our society. So once I've gotten you on board with the idea that uh, we ought to do something, the first question that arises is, okay, what kind of fairness metrics am I actually supposed to choose? Um, so this leads back to a paper that um, Brent Middleset and Chris Russell, so the three of us again, uh, wrote earlier, uh, yeah, last year, um, which was called uh, Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated, Bridging the Gap Between EU Non-Discrimination Law and AI. Paper is also publicly available if anybody um, cares to, to have a look at that. And this is exactly when we tried to answer that question, trying to figure out what does fairness actually mean, um, both in legal and in tech terms. So what we try to do is to figure out uh, what the European Court of Justice actually thinks is fair. And it will come as no surprise um, to anybody who's ever worked with lawyers that there is no coherent standard of what fairness and equality actually means, hence the name of the paper. However, there are very important hallmark judgments, and this is one of them, that started to venture into these directions and try to assess how you, sh how, how you should be evaluating evidence uh, when you're making decision if illegal disparity has actually occurred. And the way that the court wants that to assess, we then use that notion and we're asking the question, is there a counterpart in computer science? And there is. And the counterbalance is, the counterpart is called conditional demographic disparity. So that's our idea of trying to marry what the law thinks fairness means, the metrics that the, the law is using, and finding a counterpart in computer science, um, which is called demographic, uh, conditional demographic disparity. Um, again, this is a, a whole other paper that I cannot go into detail, but the main contribution of the test that we have developed here is that it makes open the testing results for group differences and it makes open the variables that you have conditioned on. We recommend actually that you publish the summary statistics of your test to allow people to assess this because this is when the actual interesting um, conversation starts to happen and the very uncomfortable conversation that we need to have, which is the question, what type of disparity is acceptable in a society and which is not. So if our bias test, it will tell you how group differences are occurring in the outcomes. And it will also tell you the criteria that we're conditioned on. So for example, if you're using salaries to give out loans, you can start a dialogue between groups and say, is it fair to use salary as a condition and factor when giving out loans, even though we know about income inequality? Or would you say, well, yes, there is income inequality, and we admit that, but giving people loans who are not able to repair them might indebt them even further. 
Or you can have a third strand of conversation say, well, okay, um, salary is obviously not a good proxy. Is there any other variable that we can use that is less discriminatory, but has a similar way of assessing credit worthiness? And that is the dialogue that we need to have um, because otherwise we will never get to informed discussion of what kind of disparity is actually acceptable and what is the disparity that we need to tackle together. So let me um, conclude and um, go back to uh, the, the first slide that, that I had when I uh, was talking to you about the findings of the paper. If you, if you remember, I said there are three um, paths ahead of us. Um, we can either do nothing and just let's wait and see how things are actually getting worse. Um, or we can do what has been primarily been done, which is trying to fix the technology. Or we have a third strand, and that's my personal preference, is use technology as a way of diagnosing inequalities and trying to figure out if we can tackle them head on. Those are the three options that we have in front of us. From a legal perspective, it's clear what you should be doing anyway, at least in Europe it is. It is very clear from a legal perspective that the status quo is not neutral. That is confirmed in statistics, in theory, in case law, in law itself. Um, this is where we need to get our head in that we need to acknowledge that inequality has a fact become a fact that needs to be disproven and not the other way around. And Europe and European non-discrimination law says very clearly keeping things as they are, maintaining the status quo is just not good enough. European discrimination law wants to achieve substantive equality. So main arguments, the status quo is not neutral and you actually ought to do something about it. The other contribution of the paper was to say um, that choosing a fairness metrics is not a neutral act. You need to be very aware of the underlying assumptions of those bias metrics. You have bias preserving metrics um, that are trying to match the error rates, which is more akin to formal equality. And you have bias transforming um, bias metrics that are trying to match decision rates, which is more akin to uh, formal equality as well as substantive equality. Um, as I said, by choosing a fairness metrics, you're making an explicit decision if the status quo is acceptable or not. And if you're using a bias preserving metrics, the one that says it's okay how things are, and you deploy them in a sector where bias is known and the sector is protected, then you're making yourself up to liability and you need to justify that choice on the legal terms. Um, yes. This is, as I said, um, even though there's a very clear underlying assumption in the paper, we also make clear that there is room for bias preservation, uh, fairness metrics. And I know because it's a jungle, it's a very, very complex topic where you have to think about ethics and law and computer science, trying to figure out what the right fairness metrics actually is can be extremely burdensome. So what we try to do in the paper is actually come up with a checklist um, that helps you navigate through that. Again, remember 13 out of 20 of those metrics are bias preserving but they can be used for certain purposes. So we came up with this, with this guide that hopefully will be helpful for individuals to navigate um, through all of this, um, to, to make sure that you're choosing the bias metrics that is the most appropriate for whatever goal you're actually um, preserving, uh, pursuing. Um, as I said, um, we, we wrote a paper, um, especially the European context, uh, where we tried to figure out what type of fairness test would be the most appropriate according to the aims and goals of non-discrimination law. And as I said, um, we came up with conditional demographic disparity that lets you do that, where the good idea is that you make very open and clear what the conditions are, uh, the variables are that you condition on and allow people to have an informed discussion um, around that. Um, I'm very excited to share that this particular bias test and the work that we have been doing on, 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 on fairness in general has been picked up by Amazon recently, I think in December um, or so they announced their SageMaker Clarify bias toolkit, which is now available for all customers of Amazon Web Services, uh, where one of the bias tests that they're actually proposing and offering is exactly the test that we have developed, which is extremely exciting, is 
always extremely rewarding and, and, and wonderful to see that the, the things that you um, are passionate about are also helpful for people who work in the field. So let me close by saying how I, 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 I think we need to take this conversation forward. Um, I think it's very important that we um, acknowledge the fact that technology alone will never fix society. And the idea of just throwing more data at the problem is also not the answer. What we actually need is commitment for social change. And I really hope that bias metrics, especially bias transforming metrics such as CDD, can be a tool for that. Um, with summary statistics where you make very open the test results and the criteria that you're using, you can start to have a conversation of what type of disparities and biases are actually acceptable in our society and which are not and which are the ones we need to tackle and which are actually fine to have. Um, we really, really need to start to have a conversation about the society that we want to live in. And we must not allow technology to freeze the status quo because we will never achieve social equality if we settle for the status quo. Thank you very much. <laughs>